50 J&L guards joined a sheriff's posse financed by local steel companies. On October 5, 1933, they confronted strikers at the Spang Shalfat Steelworks. One man was killed, 20 wounded. The NRA had failed to protect workers' rights to organize unions. More than a year later, in an effort to limit strike violence and protect labor, Congress passed the Wagner Act. Although it did not cover farm workers, it promoted collective bargaining in the industrial workplace and gave the National Labor Relations Board the power to stop unfair labor practices by employers. When the Wagner was passed, this was a kind of renaissance for those of us who had undergone all of this uh, medieval treatment in our workplaces. And uh, we uh, idolized President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We thought he was one of the greatest men ever born. And uh, he renewed our lives, our inspiration, uh, especially in our unions. Many corporate leaders were outraged by the Wagner Act and President Roosevelt. In Aliquippa, J&L defied the new law. The legal struggle would go all the way to the Supreme Court. Tom Girdler, now head of Republic Steel, saw the Wagner Act as a threat to his relationship with his employees. Girdler had built Republic Steel into a profitable powerhouse. He wanted no government interference. Father thought Franklin Roosevelt was a disaster. It was during the Roosevelt years that the adversarial relationship between the unions and the companies was promoted to the greatest extent by the union and backed by the government. You may say that I John L. Lewis, president of the United Mine Workers, saw the Wagner Act as an opportunity to organize all industrial workers, including the millions of factory workers and blacks and immigrants excluded by the American Federation of Labor. Lewis broke with the AFL and formed the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. The workers of this country want representation. They want organization. They want participation. They want protection. They want employment. And they're going to have those things through the leadership and the instrumentality of this new labor movement that you're forging. John L. Lewis's main target was the steel industry, the citadel of anti-unionism. Steel underlay the whole industrial American operation. At the time when we were a country of smokestack industry, we needed steel to make the automobiles. We needed steel for all the purposes of industry. If there was no steel, there was no industry. This was the heart of the matter. In June 1936, Lewis formed the Steel Workers Organizing Committee, SWAC. The CIO pledged a half million dollars to begin the battle with the steel companies. Lewis chose Phil Murray, vice president of the mine workers, to head SWAC. Murray broke with tradition by including blacks and communists on his organizing team. There was a ferment that's hard to imagine. People ran out of cards. 
you know, you went out to organize, you didn't have to plead with people and convince them. They grabbed the cards. They were ready. They'd been long ready. This was a depression. They wanted something done. I didn't, you know, never attended a union meeting before, and there was an outside guard. And this guard uh, asked me where I was going. I said, is this a meeting of 1014? He said, yeah. I said, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a member. I'd like to go. He said, you know the password? I said, what password? Never heard of a password. So uh, he looked at me, and I guess he recognized I was sincere. He said, well, look, I'm going to give you the password. You're not to repeat it to anybody, whether they're members of the union or not. And you're not to write it on anything. You have to memorize it. I said, OK. And he whispered to me, expansion. I know it to this day, I know it. In the 1936 presidential election, big business spent heavily to defeat Roosevelt and end the advance of unions. But labor fought back. Unlike the sharecroppers in the South, union members in the North had the vote. The CIO held hundreds of rallies for the president and registered thousands of new voters. Seeking their support, Roosevelt made labor's enemies his own. That this concentration of economic power in all embracing corporations does not represent private enterprise as we Americans cherish it and propose to foster it. On the contrary, it represents private enterprise which has become a kind of private government and is a power unto itself a regimentation of other people's money and other people's lives. The uh, Roosevelt administration did everything they could to further the interest of the working people. By the working people, I mean the union people, because there was more votes there than there were any other place else, and I think it was primarily for that reason. <laughs> Two months after Roosevelt's landslide victory, John L. Lewis began secret negotiations with Myron Taylor, chairman of America's biggest steel corporation, U.S. Steel. Taylor had watched CIO sit-down strikers win union recognition after stopping production at General Motors. He did not want to risk a production shutdown at U.S. Steel. dollar steel industry booms. Another business follows as labor leaders sign an agreement with a great steel corporation. This is the first time in the history of the industry that a subsidiary of the United States Steel Corporation effected a bargaining agreement with an independent trade union. Well, my father and all the heads of the small steel company, Little Steel, Bethlehem Steel, Wharton, were all utterly disgusted and dismayed that Byron Taylor would sign a contract with the CIO. The smaller steel companies, known as Little Steel, vowed to stop the CIO. But in April 1937, Little Steel executives were stunned when the Supreme Court ruled against JNL and upheld the Wagner Act. Workers in Little Steel now demanded union contracts. Throughout Little Steel, what they wanted simply was what Big Steel already had. The people who were making steel for U.S. Steel were getting certain kinds, shorter hours, higher wages, certain kinds of protections. I don't know what all was in their contract, but it was a contract that for the first time gave the workers there some kind of recognition and, and had a mechanism to discuss grievances, a mechanism to try to raise wages. None of that existed in Little Steel. Encouraged by the victory in the Supreme Court, Aliquippa steel workers exercised their rights by striking at JNL, where Tom Girdler's old anti-union system still prevailed. The company had been stockpiling munitions in anticipation of a violent strike. The 37 strike came about only because we asked the company to recognize the CIO is as, as, as the only representative of the workers 
and the company turned us down. And uh, we were well prepared. We had the uh, truck on the side with weapons because the other side was all armed. They were legal, we weren't. We were really fighting for this union and we were down at the JNL tunnel and here comes this little old mail car. Of course we stopped and we weren't letting anybody in there. So this guy insisted on going in there and these people just grabbed that mail truck and upset it right down. And there was no mail in there. There was sandwiches in there. There was pop. There was stuff for them to eat and keep staying. Them little stoolies that was working for JNL got to stay in the mill as long as they wanted, as long as they could feed them. They didn't care. They, they were paying them to stay in there. If you were in a house and somebody came along and stood at the front door with a gun and said, you can't get out, you'd say somebody was invading your privacy, invading your rights. In effect, that's what the unions did. They blockaded the entrance of the plant so that the people who were in there, that stayed in there, couldn't get out, couldn't get food, couldn't get mail, couldn't get to home to see their family. On the second day of the strike, Pennsylvania Governor George Earle asked to inspect the mill accompanied by strike leader Joe Timko. The message was clear. The governor would not tolerate a repeat of the shootings at Ambridge. That same day, Timko was called to JNL's Pittsburgh office. And they gave us what we wanted. That was our right to vote for the union of our choice. SWAC won the election supervised by the National Labor Relations Board and negotiated an agreement stronger than the one at U.S. Steel. Oh boy, tell me about it. We were really, really happy. We had a parade. I'll tell you, that street was loaded with people going up the street, celebrating, hollering and screaming. That was the best day of our life, I'll tell you. <laughs> SWAC and the steel workers believed they had finally brought democracy to Aliquippa, and it now seemed that all of Little Steel would fall. Tom Girdler saw events in Aliquippa as a direct threat to the rights of management. In May, he spent $50,000 on arms and ammunition for Republic Steel. Girdler also prepared for a propaganda war, purchasing more than 40,000 pamphlets which branded John L. Lewis a communist. Father, the opinion of John L. Lewis was not the highest. In fact, he thought he was a louse. Father said that before he would sign a contract with John L. Lewis, he'd go back to raising apples in Indiana. Philip Murray was just as bad. The public cannot and will not enter into a contract, oral or written, with an irresponsible party. And the CIO, as presently constituted, is utterly irresponsible. Therefore, any discussion of this subject is futile. On May 26th, SWAC called a nationwide strike against Little Steel. The next day, Little Steel picked Tom Girdler to lead their anti-union fight. But workers believed that even Girdler could be defeated. In a show of confidence, SWAC called a Memorial Day rally in a field near Girdler's Republic Mill in South Chicago. We came out there and it was a gorgeous day, absolutely a beautiful day. People came out there like a picnic. We're going to support the steel workers and we're going to enjoy a picnic day with our families. And it looked like God shone on that idea. And at the end of the, whatever little party they had, someone said, look, let's go to the plant and set up a picket line. And they started walking towards the plant. And people were talking and, and holding hands and the children were being carried by their fathers on their shoulders I and mean, everybody was singing and joyful and very optimistic and a feeling that we're going to win this, we're really going to win it. As we came closer to the mill, the walking slowed a bit. 
Now, I wasn't way up in the front line, 